Hello everybody watching this, welcome to this. This is our fourth Lit Talk of the year from the QUB uh, Literific. My name is Thomas Copeland. I'll be guiding us through the event this evening. These Lit Talks are designed as an opportunity for students, for people who are watching our audiences to engage uh, with the political and social figures who are shaping our lives. So we want to hear from you tonight. We want to make sure that your questions and your contributions are feeded into the event. Um, it's a real pleasure tonight to welcome Conservative MP and chair of the 1922 committee, uh, Sir Graham Brady, this evening. In happier times, uh, Sir Graham uh, would be here with us uh, on a tour of Belfast student dives, um, along with Ian Blackford and Julian Smith, have both already committed to that at some point, Sir Graham. So um, we'll be expecting the same from yourself. Um, you've given up your time, so thank you very much for doing that, because I'm sure uh, you're sick of sitting in front of the screen all day as it is, but you've decided to join us this evening. So we are enormously appreciative um, of that. I'd like to thank the Literific organising this event. As always, President Matt Lee and Events Officer Ryan Hoey. Uh, the entire committee have really put a lot of work into this year's this year's uh, uh, society to make sure that they're not letting COVID get the better of them. Here's how this event is going to work. You've been feeding your questions into me, into the society over the last couple of days. I've roughly amalgamated them into a kind of a roadmap. Uh, so, so there's a little bit of logic to where we're headed, but you can ask more questions. So whatever platform you're watching this on, we have people watching the various feeds. Uh, if you stick a question on the stream, whether it's Facebook or wherever you're watching, uh, we'll try to feed that in as well. Um, there's so much to talk about, Sir Graham. Do you want to just dive in? I want to talk about your political journey, grammar schools, 1922, Brexit, COVID. There's a lot there. Um, let's start off with a very quick summary. Um, born in Salford, and then you were educated in Altrincham at Altrincham Grammar School for Boys, which is a fact that will become very important later. Um, and then on to Durham to read law. W when does politics and electoral politics in particular start entering your life, Sir Graham? I think probably when I got to Durham University, really, and I kind of coming from a fairly ordinary background, I thought uh, getting to Durham University where there were uh, lots of um, events at the Union Society and debates with uh, black tie and fancy dinners beforehand. I thought this seems like a really good idea. I'll get involved in this and uh, and then I'll get invited to, to lots of nice dinners. And and then I, I went off the tracks completely. I got involved in the Conservative Association instead. Uh, and I regard myself as quite a, uh, a libertarian sort of conservative. Uh, but at the time, in 1986, the Conservative Association at Durham was run by quite extreme libertarians. And they spent all their time debating whether you should be allowed to sell yourself into slavery or not, and didn't uh, spend any time on the sort of more useful practical part of politics, uh, which I suppose appealed to me as well. So I stood to be chairman, and I was elected chairman in my, I guess, the end of my uh, first year, and, uh, and then uh, went on to do uh, Northern Area Conservative Students, the National Committee, and got quite involved. And the, the thing I suppose that happens to everybody in whatever walk of life, you can guarantee, and there may be people watching this this evening undergoing exactly the same experience. You watch people who are doing whatever job it is, and you think, my God, I could do better than that. <laughs> so the more you meet people who are involved as candidates, as elected politicians, that temptation to think, well, I think I could do that. And I pitched in and had a go. Were the seeds laid before that? Was it? Did you come from a political family, a political area, Sir Graham, or was this something that? Uh, I mean, how did your parents react when you said, "I'm standing for the the local, the University Conservative Association"? Uh, I'm a complete aberration. I don't think there was any political involvement uh, at any time within living memory in my in my family, um, and uh, I, I suppose that. Uh, my mum probably thought it was just me being typically odd when I uh, got involved and stood for election. I think my mum died at, at, well, what, uh, nearly 10 years ago now, uh, but she was always a little bit concerned that uh, maybe I was sticking my head up a bit too high above the parapet and, uh, and that was always going to uh, end up with things going horribly wrong. Uh, I think her, her view was, you know, just be a bit quieter and you might not get in so much trouble. I didn't quite manage that. You're no longer at university, obviously. I wonder what you think, though, about political life at university. Some of the people who are watching this will know what I'm talking about. There's been a lot of conversations at, at Queen's 
on a platform called QUB Love. You won't know what that is, Sir Graham, but the audience will, about uh, conser being conservative at university. Some folks saying, you know, it's fair game not to be friends with conservatives or not engage with them in political debate. Do you think that uh, the nature of politics at university has changed from when you were studying in, as you said, sort of the mid 80s, uh, right the way through to now? Or is that a constant dynamic and it's just, you know, it, it, this is a, an evolving thing? I think there's been an element of it down the years. Maybe Durham was a more conservative university uh, than most. But also I'd add, it, when, when I was getting involved in the mid 80s, uh, there was no question conservative politics in this country uh, was by far the most radical uh, of the mainstream parties. Uh, and it was far more exciting and interesting as a, a young person to be involved in conservative politics, uh, pushing the, the boundaries on uh, a more sort of uh, classical liberal free market kind of agenda. Um, the massive role that Margaret Thatcher played in winning the Cold War, uh, the experience I was 15 when the Falklands War happened, the experience of a country which had been seen as being down on its uppers and a bit of a laughing stock, uh, actually showing some self-confidence and, uh, and taking uh, control of itself uh, was a, a very powerful thing. So, I, but I, I think the thing I would add is I think there is a, a, a really nasty uh, and closed-minded edge uh, which has come into a lot of uh, modern politics. Partly, you might say that happens across the board on social media, but I think it is particularly a factor in parts of the left who have this idea that you shouldn't listen, that you shouldn't engage, you shouldn't have a proper discussion. Well, as far as I'm concerned, that's certainly what universities are for. It's what Parliament is for, and it's what our politics ought to be about, debating with others and showing respect for them. It's interesting. I haven't heard that articulated before, what you're saying about that sort of the radical, the radical element of conservatism in the 80s. Can you empathise, therefore, I wonder, in the last number of years when you've watched I think, objectively speaking, huge numbers of young people become involved in now the, the, the radical side is the left and Jeremy Corbyn and that youth quake. Can you see similarities then between how young people engage with radical conservatism in the 80s and now radical you know, left wing politics in, in, in the 21st century? Maybe, but it's much better to be radical and right than radical and right. <laughs> so, uh, uh, I wouldn't push that right, well. too far. OK. Um, <laughs> No doubt. Well, let's jump forward um, a couple of years. You were then uh, the youngest Tory MP when you entered Parliament in 1997, uh, age 29, I think, if I'm right. Uh, did you feel that youth at that? Obviously, you're inexperienced if you're only 29 as compared to, you know, you're 40 or 50 or something. Did you feel that kind of vulnerability being the youngest in your party when you joined in 97? Well, in a way, I mean, the whole thing... Uh, came as a shock uh, in that uh, when I was selected as a candidate for Altrim and Sale West, uh, a bit younger than that, even in October 95, uh, and it was seen as a very safe conservative seat. I hadn't fought a seat before. I was 28 years old. And, you know, I didn't think I was going to be selected. I thought I'd throw my hat in the ring. It's my hometown. And I really uh, wanted to do well. Um, but in the end, when I won the final selection, uh, I think there have been 200 or more applicants. Uh, we ended up with three of us in front of a general meeting, 200, 250 members of the association attending, and I won it on recounts. Um, so, you know, these things are, um, against, I suppose I should say, against a very nice man who was the uh, sort of local favourite. Um, and so, uh, you know, that came as a surprise. The circumstances of the 97 election then, of course, you know, I knew... Uh, that I could withstand a swing to Labour of up to 12.4%, and the biggest post-war swing had been 5%. Uh, so I thought it was going to be a bit of a squeeze, um, but I, I wasn't expecting it to be as bad a result for the party as it was. It was when somebody on election night was listening to an earpiece and had on the radio some of the other results coming in, and Malcolm Thornton, very established Conservative MP on Merseyside in Crosby, lost his seat to Labour with a swing of 14.2% that I started to get beads of sweat breaking out. Uh, but entering Parliament that young, in those circumstances, there were 165 Conservative MPs, um, a lot of the grandest ones, the 
uh, Heseltines of the world didn't spend an awful lot of time in Parliament uh, as part of that small minority. Uh, so there was a lot of it was left to those of us who just arrived. And it was a brilliant opportunity to learn, to get experience speaking in the chamber, uh, to learn the ropes. It was quite good fun as well. Nobody was remotely interested in what we were doing. Uh, we were able to try to needle the Labour Party a bit and try to make our case, make our points, uh, which is important. Uh, but you know, I, I think quite good as a young uh, member going into a parliament, if you were in a small minority like that. I would say it's a little bit like working for a small business rather than a big multinational. You get to do a bit of everything really mm -hmm. quickly. It must have been odd, though. Obviously, you 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 came up in conservative politics during the time when Thatcher was in power, and then uh, and then into Major and before that. Is there a kind of a, was there a bittersweet element of your election because you had you know you it felt as if you'd been working your way up the ranks, ready to be elected while your party was in power, and then that new Labour juggernaut comes in. Uh, is there was there a bittersweet element to that election, or did you always have in the back of your mind, you know, I know British politics it will swing back and forth, and and I, you know my party will eventually be in the governing position. Was that uh, part of your thinking? Well, I think we've always got to bear in mind whenever there's a, an election uh, result and there's a big swing one way or, or another, the people who are on the opposition side but who are elected uh, always come into Parliament with a smile on their face because uh, they had something to celebrate. And you know, whether they've uh, come in as part of a uh, you know, an enormous uh, majority for a government, they think, well, we won. Uh, if they held on while everything was going to hell for everyone else, uh, then they've had lots of people calling to congratulate them and say, thank God, some of you have held on. And, and there's been something to celebrate. Mm -hmm. um, Sir Graham, I'm going to ask you, would you be able to move just a little bit to the left for us? Oh, perfect. There we go. Just so we get the Full magnificence. There we go. Uh, there we go. That's fantastic. It, it's uh, because I just moved things to, to in case it distracts anyone. Oh, uh, that, I mean, classic. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> we could have put money on that. Um, <laughs> here's the flip side, though. I suppose having said all the things we said about, uh, you know, the, the obvious success of being elected to parliament at age only 29, there are people who would look at somebody like you or indeed anybody in that position and say they've barely spent 10 years in the world of work before they go into politics. They would say to themselves, this is exactly the kind of establishment Westminster figure who's down in Westminster doing playing House of Cards. Uh, and and uh, what do you say to that, to the, to the criticism, which is that you should have spent more time in the real world before uh, going into representative politics? And only by doing so can you properly represent uh, the interests of, of sort of normal, average, everyday people? I, I suppose I'd say elected politics is a bit of a lottery. You need a huge amount of luck and timing to be with you. Uh, lucky, as I say, I was selected by my association on recounts. Uh, that might not have happened if I hadn't have been chosen by my hometown constituency uh, as a candidate. Maybe nobody else would have done. Uh, and so you know, I know lots of people who've been trying to get elected to the House of Commons for uh, 30, 40 years. Um, and sometimes it works for people, sometimes it doesn't. Uh, the, you, know, you take your chances, you take your opportunities when they come. Uh, so, you know, personally, I think it's a good thing for the House of Commons to be a broad mixture of people. I think it would be a really unhelpful thing um, if we had uh, a House of Commons that was entirely constituted of people who are, you know, 53 years old, as I am now, um, and, you know, or, or indeed who all were engaged in the same kind of profession or went to the same kind of school, whatever it might be. So I, I think a good mixture. And after that, once you get there, you um, stand or fall on your reputation uh, and you make your own reputation and people either uh, can think, well, you know, what a jumped up idiot. Uh, and I'm sure some people would say that about me. Uh, or you can make a reputation and people will say, well, you know, tends to be worth listening to what he says. And, you know, somewhere in that balance, um, if you get more people in the latter camp than the former, I think it's probably worth you being there. OK, um, you mentioned their um, uh, sort of experiences and, and people from different backgrounds. Uh, I want to talk about grammar schools now. So uh, we said earlier you were educated at, at grammar school and then you actually you resigned from David Cameron's shadow um, 
uh, shadow uh, front bench uh, over grammar schools and, <laughs> and haven't found your way back to the front bench, at least not, not yet anyway. So clearly an important issue to you. I want to put this, if you don't mind, in, in a slightly Northern Irish context for our audience, which is to say that uh, in Northern Ireland, the grammar school system is, is much more widespread than it is in the UK. Um, so it was a sort of 1960s comprehensive education started to take hold in the UK. But I mean, in Northern Ireland, there was a government run transfer test up until 2008. Um, to the 45 percent of students in Northern Ireland attend grammar schools in England, it's probably closer to around 5 percent. So it's a massive difference there between those two, the, the experiences in England and in Northern Ireland. So that, you know, that grammar school debate is very much alive in Northern Ireland, perhaps even more so than it is in England. I, I want to kind of start at the very beginning because this is an interesting topic for a lot of people. Why are you so in favour of grammar schools? I mean, what's your kind of pitch on, on why grammar schools are a good thing? Well, I suppose I'd, I'd start off from um, my own perspective, my own experience. Uh, I think it gave me great opportunities and it gives a lot of other people opportunities they might not otherwise have. And you know, I, I think the um, way in which the grammar schools, when they were more prevalent, uh, were helping to break down social barriers in the United Kingdom, uh, were helping to make sure that uh, there was a much better mix. The upper reaches of the judiciary or the permanent secretaries in Whitehall, the part, senior partners of law firms, whatever they might be. If you look at all of those categories, you find uh, back in the uh, late 60s, early 70s, there were actually fewer um, who were public school educated because the grammar schools had been making massive inroads uh, and breaking down some of those social barriers. And that's certainly uh, been my experience. So that's that's one thing. The second thing, uh, I look at is the way the system works in my own part of the country, the borough of Trafford. But the same is true in Northern Ireland, uh, in that Trafford has got essentially a wholly selective system and so has Northern Ireland. And we actually have better results across the piece uh, than do uh, most areas which have gone comprehensive. And that's not just the grammar schools. It's the grammar schools and the high schools added together get better results uh, than most comprehensive sectors do. And certainly, if you then uh, remove the benefits of uh, more affluent uh, areas, you look at the uh, schools that are the most socially selective in the country, and the Sutton Trust, which does all that very good social mobility work, has looked at this. Um, all of the most socially selective state schools in the country are actually comprehensive schools. They're comprehensive schools in the wealthiest catchments anywhere in the country, uh, where essentially if your parents can't afford to buy a house in the right place, you don't go uh, to that school. And I mean, it's a long time ago now, but when not long after I resigned in, in 2007, I came over a couple of times to Northern Ireland. I was invited to speak uh, at some of the grammar schools and do a bit of media on the subject because I was always struck. There was a terrible kind of lack of self-confidence um, about Northern Ireland's uh, system. And you know, I, I just kept pointing out to people how it compared in terms of its results to the English education system in most places. And it came as a great revelation. So you know, all too often Northern Ireland does itself down when it's doing something uh, better than, than other people are. And the final point I make is just that I would say we should have a great diverse uh, pattern of education. You shadow all sorts of different schools and grammar schools should be a part of that. You should mm -hmm. have the same kind of opportunities for a diverse uh, offer in education in the state sector as you can if you can afford mm -hmm. to pay for it. I suppose the problem, and you mentioned aff affluence there, and, and these are, I mean, these are the common arguments. You will have heard this before. Uh, you know, in Northern Ireland, for example, um, uh, schools possess around a third as many students on free school meals, grammar schools, a third as many students on free school meals as the wider population. And you mentioned the Sutton Trust, same thing in England. They say the figures are way down to 3% of students in grammar schools on free school meals. I mean, aren't those fairly clear indications that the grammar school system perhaps unless it's you know deployed everywhere it disproportionately benefits kids from a wealthy background and in some ways there's there's a logic to that i mean pa parents can pay for tutoring they can pay for all the devices that you need as a young kid to do well and we've seen that you know in the covid pandemic to do with devices and learning from home and all this kind of stuff does the grammar school system not disproportionately benefit 
kids from wealthy backgrounds. Is that not the bottom line? I, well, I thought if you look at Northern Ireland's education system, it's also true that you do far better uh, than the rest of the country does in terms of having fewer people who emerge from education without any qualifications at all. So you know, I, I think there's a, an important argument there that says the system as a whole is delivering uh, rather the better than many other places. But I, I think you do put your finger on an important issue, uh, different maybe in North Kent and places like that, which uh, happen to be less affluent, the whole county uh, kept its grammar schools. In the context of something like Trafford, it is a problem we struggle with uh, precisely because there are no grammar schools in Leafia, Cheshire uh, to the south. Uh, there are no grammar schools in more urban Manchester to the north. Uh, so there is a pressure uh, from people wanting to come across the uh, borough boundaries to get to our schools. And you know, that uh, is a constant uh, difficulty uh, for us. It would be uh, alleviated, if not entirely solved, if we could get more grammar schools where people want them. Uh, let me ask two questions on this uh, from Grace. Um, uh, the first is a, a very simple question, I suppose, for proponents of grammar schools. Is it fair to judge a child's potential at the age of 10? Uh, you've talked about the benefit that you've derived from, from grammar school. I mean, why should a child who's just a little bit further behind but will or may catch up be deprived of that experience? That's our first question. And the second one is, uh, you attended an old boys school and a grammar school. What's your opinion on education being segregated according to gender? So you've got sort of uh, academic ability there and gender. What about that first one? Is it fair to judge a child's potential at the age of 10 through a test or two tests? Well, the most important thing I would say is you make sure that all of the schools are good schools. Uh, so that what you're doing really is trying to find uh, the most appropriate school for the child rather than a kind of 1950s, 60s view of the world where it was a pass or fail uh, view of the world. I don't think there is a single age that's obviously right for transfer uh, and certainly there used to be much more commonly 11 plus and 13 plus uh, movement between the schools. Um, I, I think that's perfectly reasonable to have more movement over a longer period of time. Um, the problem is, of course, if the other schools are good, people tend to settle in them. It doesn't necessarily become a big issue for them. So I now want to go to the, the grammar school. But uh, I, I wouldn't say a particular age to choose, nor would I stipulate a particular way of uh, selecting. Uh, but I, I think there is a lot that can be done by trying to make sure the tests that are used are um, as fair as possible, as open as possible, uh, and also that you try to make sure there's enough kind of outreach. Um, and one of the things that troubles me in, in a lot of places in England that have got grammar schools, um, where especially where it's not universal, the primary schools often don't give any experience of the kind of tests that kids are going to have to sit. And it's one of the things, my old school, Altering Boys, uh, which is part of a, a multi-academy trust of which I am a member. Uh, and I'm pleased one of the things we're working on now is to try to make sure we have the best outreach to make sure that people, especially from less advantaged uh, parts of the community, are able to have a, a fair chance of getting to the school. We're doing that mm -hmm. by offering support uh, to some of those areas. Uh, and uh, also we've now changed the entry test to one which is deemed less susceptible to tutoring. Uh, uh, oh, that's, that's, that's an interesting point actually because I know tutoring is a big issue. The other thing that, and the reason it's on my mind, uh, Sir Graham, is because we've been having a big conversation about this in Northern Ireland about how grammar schools should now select students because the, the tests were cancelled. Um, uh, the other thing that comes up quite often is um, uh, by definition of some kids are going to a grammar school and some are going to a comprehensive, you know, there needs to be a test of some kind. Is it is it right, do you think? You're clearly somebody who's got a lot of self-confidence. You need to if you're going to be a, an MP, really. Is it fair for to tell a young child at, you know, at a young age or whatever age, no, you failed, you can't make it into a grammar school, you need to go elsewhere, or am I framing the, the entire system incorrectly? I, I think you are. And I, you know, I think the danger is this is the... In, that those who oppose selection uh, very often choose to frame it in that way in order to try to make their case. You can understand why they, why they do that. Uh, but in doing so, that's, I think, where the message can come across, uh, that you either succeed by going to the grammar school or you fail by going to another school. And, you know, I, I always make the case, you know, we've got 
in my constituency, high schools, the non-grammar schools, uh, which are outstanding schools. Um, an example, Ashton Mersey High School, which uh, is uh, sponsored by Manchester United, uh, which educates the Manchester United uh, uh, juniors uh, as well. Um, it's got a very good reputation. A uh, school like Wellington School in, in Timperley, in my constituency, you know, again, these are very good schools. And I think as long as you've got uh, that um, recognition that there are a number of different schools uh, with different specialisms and different things that uh, recommend them, I, I think it, the system works well. And certainly it would be wrong to give the message to children to say they've failed because they're not going to grammar school. Uh, there are lots of people who don't go to grammar school who go to good schools and have other opportunities uh, and go on to university in just the same way. OK, uh, and what about that question to do with segregated education according to gender? You went to an all boys school. What's your perspective on that? Uh, um, I, I mean, I, I don't know. I, I think I would say that um, it's certainly in the context of what I see in my local schools now, it's less of an issue probably than it was when I was at school, uh, because there's a lot more interaction between the schools. There's more, some of it organized social interaction, uh, you know, school plays that are um, collaborative. Um, so, you know, I, I, I don't think it is a, a, a huge problem. Um, I think in some ways, like with many other things in life, the uh, question, what, how would you change it, uh, is a really tricky one. And certainly you couldn't change it by having uh, either the boys or the girls school deciding that it would um, take both. Um, it would have to be a joint decision and those things are a little bit harder. OK, I think that, OK, that, I think that's a, that's a fair that's a fair place to end the, the sort of that, that grammar schools question. I want to leap forward again then to, to the 1922 committee. You've been chairperson of that, that group of backbench MPs since since 2010. How do you describe your role are you one of the fabled you know men in gray suits of westminster mythology who tells ailing pipe prime ministers that it's time to go or is it actually much more mundane and, and less macabre than that um well the uh, i hope it is um the um uh, the first thing to say i think it's always important in an irish context to point out that the name of the committee has nothing whatsoever to do with uh, <laughs> with, with, with ireland yeah um, but um Essentially, the uh, Conservative backbenches voted in uh, 1922 at a meeting at the old Carlton Club uh, to bring the wartime coalition to an end, uh, largely, I think, because they thought that the Conservative Party was in a position to win an election outright. Uh, they, the government had no choice but to go to the country because the majority was voting against the, the essentially, I suppose, it was voting no confidence and uh, went to the country. We won a substantial majority. The committee started as a committee just of the 1922 intake of Conservative MPs. But when they decided they would set this up a few months later as a kind of self-help group, uh, they went to see the chief whip and told them what they were doing. And he was a very wise man who, instead of seeing this as a, a, an incipient a revolt of some sort and something that had to be suppressed at all costs, he saw it as an opportunity and said, well, that's great. Would it be helpful? I sent one of my whips to every one of your meetings to tell you what the forthcoming business is going to be. And they said that would be very kind. So right from the uh, inception of the committee, um, we haven't been a secret society. Um, <laughs> it's always been an open channel of communication with the whips office and therefore with the front bench. The 22 executive, the elected representative executive committee um, does meet privately. Uh, so that may be sometimes where we have slightly more uh, uh, interesting uh, discussions um, behind closed doors and it almost never leaks. Um, but the committee as a whole, <laughs> effectively, very early on, it developed into being a committee that encompassed all Conservative backbench members of Parliament. So the analogy really is with the Parliamentary Labour Party. We could be called the Parliamentary Conservative Party. We just, we're Conservative, so we keep our old name. And so the, the real core of the job is to try to make sure there is a good channel of communication with the party leader, uh, with the cabinet, uh, through the chief whip and, and with the party machinery mm -hmm. as well. And, and that's done in all sorts of different ways. We have the 
prime minister or cabinet ministers come to speak to meetings of the committee, answer questions, hear views. Um, the executive might see the prime minister, might see the party chairman, chancellor. Um, I would see those people probably more regularly and more likely in a one-on-one -on -one, uh, opportunity to give some advice on where the party is. Yeah. Try to quantify that for us, because there's a question, um, a specific one from Jane, I want to get in afterwards. How much face-to-face -face time does the job of chairman of, of the 1922 entail with the prime minister? Is there a weekly meeting? Is there a monthly meeting? Uh, how much face-to-face -face time do you get? It, it varies very much from time to time, uh, and also from prime minister to prime minister. I'm now my third uh, prime minister, and you know, I, I've always been very keen not to say I want to see the Prime Minister every week or every other week or whatever it might be. I'd far rather um, see the Prime Minister when there's a point to it. And so I think the first thing is, if I want to see the Prime Minister or speak on the phone, I can. And you know, I think that's important. So if something mm -hmm. is um, flaring up as an issue, there's a, a live concern or something which I think is going to upset a lot of colleagues, I can make sure that that is uh, fed in. Um, as, a, as a rule, I would say, uh, the times when the chairman of the 22 sees the leader of the party most often, uh, are probably the times when we're in the deepest water. Um, um, so, you know, I, I certainly got to a point where I was seeing Theresa May on a, uh, a more regular basis than probably well, either of us would have wanted. That feeds nicely into the specific question from Jane, which is which prime minister did you have the best relationship with? Or I suppose, do you have the, did you get on well with, with Mrs May, who obviously... Um, had so many issues with 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 backbench MPs. Uh, which PM did you have the best relationship with? Is the question from Jane. Um, gosh, I mean, some of this is going to have to wait for my you know, much anticipated memoirs in, right. <laughs> in, in due course. But uh, I, I think um, you know, of course, they're, they're all, all very different. Um, and certainly, you know, David Cameron, uh, very urbane, very charming. Um, and you know, I I, I think. Uh, we would have very um, forthright conversations. He would tell me all sorts of things. Um, uh, you know, something a lot of journalists will tell you as well. David Cameron was massively indiscreet. Um, so you know, he would tell you things that probably you weren't meant to know. Uh, I had a number of occasions where he'd say something to me and I'd bump into the cabinet minister responsible for the policy that he just told me about when I'd was on my way back to the, the comments and I said, oh, I gather you're doing this. And they'd look very worried and say, really? Uh, so sometimes it helped you to understand how little um, involvement some cabinet ministers have in their own uh, policy briefs. Um, uh, then Theresa, uh, I'd entered parliament with Theresa in 1997. Oddly, we both made our maiden speeches in the same debate on the um, uh, bill to abolish the assisted places scheme, which we both opposed. This is a scheme to help people from less advantaged backgrounds to uh, get places at independent schools. Um, uh, theme there uh, on social mobility. Um, uh, but Theresa, you know, she's not a very... Um, uh, can you be friends with Theresa May? Um, I'm, I, I'm sure you can be, but she's, you know, right. she's, she's, she's not a, a, a sort of genial, hail fellow, well met. Uh, sort of, she's she's very private. Uh, she's very quiet. Um, so the contrast there was immense. And you know, I, uh, as I used to say to people, when I saw David Cameron, um, he'd have his shoes off and his uh, feet up on the table and his hands behind his head as he sprawled on the sofa. And when I went in to see Theresa, we'd drink tea from China cups and right, saucers. Yeah. Um, and and, and then Boris Johnson is a different thing altogether. Oh, well, what's what? How how different is he then? I suppose. Um, well, you know, Boris. Um, <laughs> On that yeah. spectrum of David Cameron to Theresa May, where where in the middle does Boris Johnson lie? Yes, or a different spectrum altogether. Oh, I don't know. Right, yeah. but, uh, I, I would say um, he's brilliant at keeping talking until the meeting's over. That that's the challenge. <laughs> right. Okay. Okay. Um, have you had a preference out of the three in terms of, of what you've been trying to do and achieve? Um, that'll wait for the memoirs, I think. Right, okay. Um, I, I want to ask about this, this. It's an interesting position to be in, to be in the governing party, but a backbench MP, because there are so many, you know, there are m multiple motivations at play. You've got your party in government, 
you want to follow your own agenda, maybe your constituency's agenda, maybe you've got your fingers crossed for a cabinet job. Um, uh, what is the job of a, of a governing party backbench MP? Well, I, I think in general, um, you know, I, I, my position is, is rather different. Um, but you know, in, in general, I've, I've just got a huge amount of sympathy for uh, backbench members of parliament, especially uh, when you're in government. Uh, because uh, there's a great tendency, the sort of Westminster system uh, would really rather not hear from you in those circumstances. Um, uh, they want you to go and dutifully vote uh, with the government on every occasion. Um, they want you maybe to make you know, very loyal interventions in the chamber in order to demonstrate that we all love each other dearly at all times. Um, but in terms of an actual contribution uh, to debate, uh, maybe questioning the direction in which policy is moving on something, even if it's an area in which you've got considerable expertise. Um, generally, governments don't much, much want to hear from their own backbenchers. And you know, an opposition backbencher has far more license, generally, to get engaged in campaigning, get engaged in debates in the chamber, in committees in the House of Commons, mm. and can be you know, much more uh, enjoyable. Is that is that reality damaging to uh, governance to democracy in the UK in your view? Well I you know I've said many times before I, I think there's a, a very big problem in that uh, in our uh, constitutional arrangements without a proper separation of powers um, there is a, a kind of confusion of uh, the, the uh, linkage of uh, if you like performance and reward. You know, I think if you ask most people in the public what they want from their members of parliament, um, they would quite like somebody who uh, is a kind of independently minded um, local champion um, who will uh, go out and speak without fear or favour. Um, they don't necessarily, I mean, they will also want somebody who helps to make sure their preferred party is in government if that's possible, um, but they don't necessarily want somebody who's going to agree with their party leadership at all times. Uh, they quite like the idea that members of parliament are going to be a little bit sparky and a little bit difficult and are going to put a bit of challenge. But uh, the uh, kind of career structure and rewards in the House of Commons all run in the opposite direction. Uh, more often than not, if you want to get um, a, a quote unquote promotion, uh, get paid more as a government minister, get the ministerial driver, uh, the extra status and the extra airtime that go with, with that, um, you're more likely to do that um, by towing the line than you are by being uh, difficult. How regular an occurrence is this then, Sir Graham? How often do you think you see somebody, a, a new MP coming in and a brand new intake who's, who starts off very principled? And I, I mean, can you recognise the trajectory, which is that this, you know, this person has seen the uh, has seen the ministerial car driving past, and now they're voting a lot with the government and and maybe the, that policy that they were very passionate about. I oh, know. I mean, how, can you recognise that trajectory at, in front of your eyes? Yeah, I mean, it, it's. I think some people would say it's the art of good whipping, um, which is <clears> yeah. you know, that, um, the the time when when a backbencher um, votes in a in a way which isn't uh, appreciated by the the whip's office. And you know, a whip takes them aside and says, such a shame. We all thought you had such a great future here. Um, and uh, so the, the little bit of the drip feed of, you know, you were going to do great things, uh, but obviously only if you uh, keep your nose clean. I, I think, you know, there is a danger in that. And the, I, I always try not to be uh, overly critical of um, backbench MPs on either side of the house. Um, they are existing within an ecosystem uh, where it's always very easy to say, um, if only I can get that next um, step up the ladder, then I'm going to be important enough uh, that people are really going to have to listen to me. I can remember uh, Patrick McLaughlin, who's now in the House of Lords, but uh, for many years he was uh, Deputy Chief Whip in opposition, Chief Whip in, uh, in government, uh, he was uh, party chairman, transport secretary, um, and uh, uh, Patrick 
uh, said this to me uh, once a couple of years ago. You know, he said, uh, when I was made a junior minister, he said, I thought, that's great, I'm going to have some real influence. And then I was told that my job was to do whichever events the Secretary of State didn't want to do himself. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, and then I became the, uh, the Deputy Chief Whip. Now I'm near the centre. Um, yeah. I'm afraid it, it, it goes on. Um, but it, it's, it's I, what I would say is it's the most difficult balance to get right. And for a member of parliament, um, you can very easily always be the maverick, always you know, cause difficulties for your party. And you might get a certain amount of public recognition and a little bit of notoriety here or there. Um, but you probably will have no influence because your own party will find you annoying. Um, so being sufficiently difficult to be the grit in the oyster, um, but without always being a pain in the backside. Um, mm -hmm. you know, I, I, it's, a, it's a very difficult spot to find. Yeah. I, I want to ask more about uh, the 1922 because I, I want to get on to Brexit and a bit of COVID as well. Um, it's amazing we've got this far and haven't really talked about Brexit. What, one of those uh, the big jobs of the, of the chairman of the 1922 is to collect those letters of no confidence. So um, if we can dive into Brexit ever so slightly, the, the last moment i suppose of, of of that significance was december 2018 again uh, with theresa may intense opposition to the irish backstop element of her withdrawal deal um how does this process actually work does somebody hand you a letter in the corridor secretly leave it on your desk does an aide come scuttling past uh, and say and and, and and you know stick it in a bag or how, how, do, how does the how does this work all of the above but if it's um not possible to be absolutely certain um, who has written the letter, uh, then I would check. Uh, so, you know, I did accept um, emails, for instance, but I only accepted them if I'd spoken to the individual as well um, and just checked that it was going to happen. And obviously, you know, the numbers aren't huge. 15% of the parliamentary party, uh, famously in that parliament, it was mm. 48. Um, so, um, yeah, I, but I had all of the above. And have you ever come across a, a fraudulent no confidence letter that's implied and that's clearly what you're checking for have you come I, across I one yet i haven't but um my predecessor michael spicer uh said that I, I think it was the time when uh there was an attempt to get the requisite numbers uh for a confidence based in ian duncan smith in yeah. 2003 uh he said he did have a lot of rather similar looking letters on carlson club headed note paper and when he checked with the people who'd apparently written them, they, they all denied it. Uh, so um, wow. I think it's, it is just worth being uh, cautious. As, I, as I've said before, one of the things that surprised me most, um, which again, Michael Spicer had the same thing, is the odd occasions when um, colleagues will say publicly that they've written a letter calling for a no confidence vote to the chairman of the 1922 committee, but actually they haven't. Um, is it, you can almost understand why people would do the opposite um but it, it's that's an interesting one <laughs> actually do you know what? It's, that's extraordinary that you would uh, that uh, your predecessor came you know people i don't know why that particularly strikes me making up notes of you know on such an important issue i suppose uh, at the time in duncan smith wasn't in government so there's a slight but uh, yeah I, I don't know i find that extraordinary um did you vote of course they may it? not have been written by colleagues they could have been written by other people claiming to be oh well yes i suppose that's true Yes, you've slightly salvaged the reputation of the of the parliamentary party there, uh, only ever so slightly. Um, do you vote in the uh, no confidence? Uh, you know, you're the sort of the returning officer, I suppose, as 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 uh, chairman of the 1922. Do you did you subsequently vote in the confidence vote in Theresa May in December 2018? Yes, but I you know I, I wouldn't divulge how I vote. S similarly, in a leadership election, I wouldn't divulge. OK, well, because it, it ties nicely to a question from Emily, which is, when did you know that Theresa May's time was up? Hmm. Um, I mean, I, I think, um, if not before, when we had that uh, December the 12th, 2018 uh, confidence vote um, and she won with, I think, 60 percent uh, or it might have been slightly over 60 percent, uh, but it was something like 40 percent that had voted uh, no confidence. And, you know, I, I thought that was going to be a difficult thing to come back from, uh, particularly in those uh, circumstances with very contentious stuff going on and with no majority. Uh, so, you know, it was just quite hard to see 
um, how that was going to end in any other way. Okay. Um, were you sad to see uh, you, you you entered with Theresa May at the same time? Did you have any sympathy for her? She famously, um, whether she cried or not, but there was certainly a, a display of emotion uh, outside the front of, of Downing Street when she did eventually left the office. Did you have sympathy for her or have years at the heart of Westminster hardened your nose? <laughs> um, I think, you know, these are, um, it's always easy to forget, they're human beings. Uh, they're human beings who go through, you know, enormous pressures. And uh, I, I guess at that point, um, I think you would be very hard not to have sympathy uh, for somebody. I, I also, you know, I felt that uh, Theresa was somebody who, uh, I believe, always tried uh, to do the right thing. Um, now, obviously, the negotiations didn't get to the right place. And I was uh, the first person, I guess, to raise concerns about the uh, Northern Irish Protocol. I went to see her privately uh, before the thing was published based on mm -hmm. the um, press briefings that were going on to say there's no way this is going to get through Parliament. Yeah. Um, so, um, you know, I, of course, there had been problems and I wasn't always going to go along with what she was proposing. Um, but I think she always tried to do the right thing. I had sympathy for that. I, I, wanted, I want to move on to that and the Brady Amendment. I, I suppose one thing that, that I'd like to ask off the back of what you've just said, uh, Theresa May is obviously now a backbench MP um, uh, and has done a lot of work and has been praised actually, I think, in a lot of quarters for stuff like uh, domestic abuse during lockdown, all these kind of areas. What what happens to, an, is there a show of deference to somebody like Theresa May in the 1922 committee meetings? What kind of dynamic is that when a former prime minister, especially one who had as difficult a time as she did and, and received so much opposition from within her own party, How what kind of dynamic is that for her to stick around because obviously David Cameron didn't for any mm. length of time and many other leaders don't well and it's become the default for leaders not to uh, prime ministers not to stick around uh, which I think is rather regrettable and you know even though I didn't generally see eye to eye with Ted Heath at least over European matters he was there for my first uh, parliament I thought it added something having somebody who'd been in that uh, most difficult uh, job leading government uh, to contribute in the House of Commons. Uh, I wouldn't say there's necessarily deference um, if Theresa you know, is in a meeting of the 1922 committee. I would certainly say there is respect. Uh, and you know, I, I think you know, these things, again, are really very difficult. Um, there would be people who um, supported Theresa to the end, um, who you know, maybe nonetheless um, were relieved when it was all over, and thought, well, now we can move forward. And there will be people who uh, thought, you know, my God, I can't see how this is going to end well, we're going to have to change leader, and were pressing from early on uh, to have a confidence vote, um, who um, nonetheless uh, think that she's a decent woman and were sorry to see the way in which it came to an end. Yeah. Um, so, you know, I, I do think that there is a respect for people who have been in the um, crucible. Uh, Part of the storm. Born all those things. Um, uh, let's let's go straight into Brexit then, uh, as opposed to skirting around it. The, your stamp on the whole process, uh, the Brady Amendment. Now, for those of you who are listening who are lucky enough to have forgotten about all this, the Brady Amendment was that amendment to Theresa May's deal in January 2019, which essentially said, we'll vote for this if you remove the, the Irish backstop. So I'd added a lot of clarity in a very confused time, focus the spotlight on the backstop rather than, you know, a sort of a plethora of other issues that were being raised. Um, I wonder briefly, how, how did that come about? You mentioned just there that you had a meeting with Theresa May very early on and said, this isn't gonna fly. Was that in your, at the time, was that in your mind to go, actually, you know, we amendment would, would, would focus some of this, be a lightning rod for this criticism and focus it? Uh, how, how did that Brady Amendment come about? Because it was a critical moment in that sort of months of Brexit psychodrama. <laughs> well, what I wanted um, when I went to see her privately to say this won't get through Parliament um, was um, for her to um, accept that it wasn't going to get through Parliament and to uh, try to change it. Um, because I just didn't think there was any point in putting the, the thing to the House of Commons in that form. Um, so, you know, we then were told that it was going to be put before the Commons. Uh, then 
then it was deferred uh, until after Christmas. There was an attempt to get some clarification, but that didn't really go anywhere. So by the time the House of Commons came back from uh, Christmas, uh, it was clear there was a, a need to try to find uh, a way of breaking the logjam. And there'd been a, a number of us, um, Andrew Morrison, who was then the chairman of the Northern Ireland Select Committee, had also been involved in trying to find uh, ways forward on this. Um, but I, I put forward uh, the amendment. Um, and it was, I, you know, I think, a crucial point that, that there had been some consideration that we could try to amend it, uh, saying that you need the um, uh, withdrawal agreement and the political declaration. But that clearly wasn't a runner because the political declaration, whilst not technically binding in a statutory way, uh, was a clear indication of what the end point was meant mm -hmm. to be. Uh, looking back now, do you have any, uh, is regrets the right word, I don't know, in, in blocking that Irish backstop? Northern Ireland is now divided from the rest of the UK uh, by uh, what is essentially an Irish sea border. An Irish sea border proposed, incidentally, by the, the leader of the Conservative and Unionist Party that, that you supported, Boris Johnson, was casting aside the, the Irish backstop a rash decision? I simply don't think there was any way in which the um, the, the agreement with the backstop was going to succeed, and you know, of course, that that proved to be the case um, in that Parliament. Um, and you know, I certainly, you know, I, th I think there, there were two very significant problems with the agreement that uh, Theresa May brought back. Um, one was that uh, Northern Ireland would be treated differently, and I think we have obviously got a degree of that under the current circumstances. The other was the capacity for the whole of the United Kingdom to be uh, required to remain in the customs union uh, against its wishes, because the agreement said that uh, the United Kingdom would only be able to leave the customs union if the EU agreed to that happening. Um, so, you know, it was, it was a an, an odd agreement um, to have reached, and, and it certainly wasn't going to go through in the 17 to 19 Parliament. Um, a, a fascinating essay question for uh, somebody as to whether it would have got through uh, in the in the 2019 Parliament. There's a related question here from Umar. Uh, given your responsibility for the Brady Amendment, uh, which led to the end of the original backstop, what reforms and what are your thoughts on the current Northern Ireland Protocol, which has been heavily criticised by unionists in Northern Ireland? Um, yeah, from Umar. Well, I mean, I, I think an awful lot of this ought to be uh, achievable through good faith. And, you know, I, I, I hope that the difficulties we had a couple of weeks ago at the Irish border uh, with the Commission uh, seeking to close the border for the purposes of vaccines. I hope that there might end up being uh, some um, positive uh, result arising from that, uh, in that I think the affront to the United Kingdom government was uh, probably only surpassed by the level of affront to the government of the Republic, uh, in that the Commission hadn't consulted with either. So, you know, I, I think the determination of both governments to make sure that we operate uh, the arrangements relating to uh, the Irish border and indeed to the GB Northern Ireland uh, mm -hmm. passage of goods um, ought to be something which is dealt with uh, bilaterally with good faith. And, you know, one might say the common travel area and the common employment area, which existed for so many decades without any legislative underpinning show that a little bit of common sense uh, relating to uh, the Irish border can work. I, I, it strikes me, though, I mean, what you're saying right now, I imagine would be cold comfort to the likes of the DUP who are, you know, coming out swinging, saying we need to abolish the Northern Ireland Protocol. Would it be fair to say that you are more on board with where 
uh, Michael Gove and his EU counterparty are, which is to say that you'd like to reform it and, and, and make small ameliorations and small changes to fix the situation rather than what the DUP, for example, and the UUP are suggesting, which is axe it altogether. I think if it's operated sensibly, that would be more than a small amelioration. I, I think with sensible operation, recognising that the biggest flows of goods are with trusted traders that are well known and move things on a daily basis. You can take out huge amounts of goods that are moved and recognise that there's really no need to uh, be concerned about them, whether they're crossing the border or crossing the Irish Sea. Uh, and you know, moving to some sensible intelligence-led checks using technology properly. Um, and I think Bertie Ahern said something uh, on that subject not long after the referendum when you know, he said 90% of it can be dealt with by technology and the other 10% will just turn a blind eye to. Well, you know, that might have been a, a, a sort of a, a, a sort of florid way of putting it. Mm -hmm. um, it, it, it sort of strikes me, though, and I want to move on to COVID in just, in just one moment, though. I mean, there are two problems here, as raised by the unionists in Northern Ireland. One is what we've just been talking about, which is the technical problem. So that's where technology and good faith and small ameliorations come in. And the other one that a lot of unionists have concerns about and are looking to Boris Johnson uh, and I suppose other Tory MPs like yourself to get on board is this constitutional problem, which is how can you and other Tory uh, conservative and unionist MPs uh, look yourself in the mirror knowing that a, a part of the United Kingdom is, is being treated very differently from the rest of the United Kingdom. Um, do you have much truck with that argument? Well, you know, I, I guess the Anglo-Irish agreement treated Northern Ireland differently from the rest of the United Kingdom. The uh, oddity, I suppose, about this uh, is, is that one of the um, unionists' perfectly reasonable concerns is the extent to which the protocol acts against the Anglo-Irish agreement uh, in itself. So I think you know, th there are clearly uh, significant difficulties which need to be uh, resolved. Um, I, I guess the, you know, the answer is that moving from an arrangement for the United Kingdom that had been in place for uh, 45 years, um, 47 or 8 years by the time we actually left, um, uh, was always going to be uh, difficult and going to have some uh, sort of jagged edges. Um, and those are things that need to be resolved. OK, um, a, a final question on this from Olivia. Uh, speaking honestly, how much did you think about Northern Ireland when you campaigned for Brexit in 2016? Um, well, I mean, I've said many times I, I was a shadow Europe minister uh, from 2004 to seven, my uh, view then was that we should seek the return of competences from Brussels. Um, I think overall it would have been uh, preferable uh, to um, bring back competences on a more gradual basis if it was possible to do so, rather than having a referendum. Um, once we ended up with a referendum, um, with a, a sort of straightforward binary choice, uh, do you wish to be an independent self-governing democracy or not? Um, there was only one answer that I could supply to that question. Uh, so, you know, I, I, I think um, the, the difficulty, I took it as a uh, very likely the, the last occasion on which the British people would have the opportunity uh, to decide uh, an existential question. Mm. That sounds a bit like a no, to be honest, does it not? No, that, that... Fully, aware, fully aware and... and um, uh, and, and always very fond of Northern Ireland as well. I say, I hope in a non-patronising way, not least because I, I spent half my teenage years with uh, 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 my best friend was uh, from Northern Ireland and I spent half my time with his family. So you know, always aware of and always, always very sympathetic too. Um, but um, the question before us was one that, in my view, could only have one answer. OK, um, I, well, we'll not resolve any life uh, long questions there. I want to move on to COVID, though. You're heavily involved in this COVID recovery group. I, again, another group of backbench Tory MPs formed in opposition to some of these latest lockdown measures. I wonder, for the benefit of the audience, if you could give your a, a quick assessment of how you think the government has handled this crisis. I suppose we can split it in half. One is the initial lockdown in March uh, and the other is I suppose everything from maybe the summer or, 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 
or the autumn onwards, and then we can have a chat about the ins and outs. But I, I, I think a quick assessment from yourself would be beneficial. Yeah, that's. A, I, mean, I think it's a good division there. The original lockdown in March, um, you know, I think lots of us were um, concerned that the government was taking very wide-ranging emergency powers, um, but were content uh, to let it do so. Uh, and indeed, the House of Commons didn't vote, it just nodded through the uh, Coronavirus Act uh, late in, in March uh, last year. Um, but of course, we were being told this was in order to lock the country down for three weeks to prevent the possibility of uh, intensive care capacity in the NHS being overwhelmed. Um, and at a time when we didn't know just how dangerous uh, COVID was going to be, was it like um, you know, Ebola or the Black Death, um, or or something significantly less bad than that. And you know, I think the the knowledge that we've got since is that it's something which is considerably worse than a bad flu year, um, but isn't Ebola. It lies somewhere in between, and we've gained a certain amount of knowledge about um, what is effective and what isn't effective in dealing with it. And you know, in some ways, the most the, well, well, I just say the, the, the earliest um, key piece of information was that the first wave was falling uh, before the first lockdown started, uh, which suggested that some combination of hand hygiene and social distancing uh, done on a voluntary basis was having an effect on the levels of infection. So, you know, I, th I think that was a, an important point to take on board. The fact that we then had the three week um, lockdown going on for three months uh, before it started uh, to be uh, relieved um, uh, was also significant. There are people, and I know you will have heard this before as well, who, who look at, uh, I suppose, Tory MPs, but people across the board saying things like this, things like, a, a quote from you, arbitrary rules and, and limitations on freedom should be removed. Or you saying, for example, that, and this is not, a, you know, this isn't a, a revelation, this is a, a well-known quote, to, that some British people were too willing to stay at home. And they will respond, a classic Tory only cares about the economy, wealth before health, um, a, you know, a live and let die, everybody get out there. And if you're vulnerable, do your own thing. Um, uh, I suppose in a, in a period of, of real national consternation, you can understand why people react in certain ways. Uh, my question, though, is, is there an, a real alternative to a lockdown in that it seems though, you know, transmission rates are the problem and a very effective way of lowering transmission rates is to encourage people through coercion in this case, through regulations and closing bars and pubs or whatever it is, to stay at home. I mean, it seems like a fairly logical equation. A logical equation if you could say that it certainly worked and if you could say that it was clearly the case that the uh, harm that it does uh, isn't greater than any benefit that it brings. So uh, to take um, various aspects of, of what you've said, um, first of all, I say, I, you know, I, I in many ways go beyond what the uh, COVID recovery group uh, would say, or at least the position that some of them say and have taken, and that I would say that some of those human rights are an absolute. Uh, so I would vote against these measures on the, the basis that we have legislated to make it illegal for people to see their children or their grandchildren. Um, the fact that we uh, now, for most of the last year, um, have been in the position of putting in place grossly inhumane restrictions on visits for people living in care homes and people in particular with dementia who don't know why they appear to have been abandoned. So you know, I, there are things in the restrictions that I would simply never support, um, certainly not for more than a two, three week period, that kind of exceptional, this is something we must do well, in the emergency. Can I interrupt you just there to say that, and I don't want to get into sort of ethics too much, on one hand, you say it's an absolute human right. Mm -hmm. And on the other hand, you say, well, I would actually stomach it for two to three weeks. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, it, it, is it not the case that, um, you know, if you're going to if you're going to allow for these what you perceive to be absolute human rights to be suspended in some cases, then it's just a fairly legitimate debate over where that line should be. 
Uh, so you'd be well within your rights to say, well, 100,000 people have died in this country. We can suspend what you perceive to well, be absolute human rights. No, I, I, I think that is the crucial question. And you're right. I shouldn't have said an absolute. Indeed, I said to Boris Johnson in the House of Commons, uh, it's not an absolute, but it should be the strongest presumption. And you know, so I, I think that is exactly the question we needed to ask ourselves. And we never really have. We've never had the proper debate. And you know, I, I think uh, the nation asked, will you put up with this for three weeks last March, was reasonably happy um, to put up with it and say, fine, I won't see the kids. Um, uh, we won't have that birthday party, whatever it was. It didn't seem like a huge sacrifice. You roll it forward for a year. You then have the, the you know, um, uh, the, the uh, Belfast variant or whatever it might be. There's the latest new concern about the spread of COVID. And um, and there's reason for owning it on for another three months. And mm -hmm. then maybe maybe it's just not safe to do these things at all. So, you know, I just think it's it is a critically important uh, issue. We've never really had that debate mm -hmm. as a country. Uh, so that, that, that's the, the, the first thing. Okay. Second thing I wanted to say, the, um, you quote that point, people being too happy to stay at home, the point in the late spring when we were looking at when to open up to an extent. And the reason I raised that was having just had a conversation, uh, well, a number of conversations with a local uh, business who said, we've still got 25% of our order book to fulfill. Um, and I need some of my workforce to come in in order to keep things ticking over. And I can't get anybody to come in. They're all saying, no, I've got a right to stay at home on furlough. Um, and the concern was that uh, if they did all stay at home on furlough, um, there wouldn't be any jobs at the end of that period when they wanted to go back to them. And the business in question, uh, Julie, uh, went bust in September with a loss of 850 jobs. Uh, so you know, I, I make no apologies for caring about other people's mm -hmm. uh, welfare and, mm -hmm. and their livelihoods. Um, and, and then the, the uh, final point I wanted to make, uh, because your division between March and the summer, um, it really is the point where I thought this needed to be looked at in a different way, uh, because it was the end of July when my part of the country uh, was told most of Greater Manchester, we were told, oh, the rates there, they were about 35, 37, I think, per 100,000 in my borough. Um, they're so high, we're going to put you into you know, strong additional restrictions. So for most of Greater Manchester, we've had a ban on household mixing, uh, for instance, since then. Uh, we saw under those severe restrictions, we saw the uh, rate of positive tests go up significantly. We've seen it fall, we've seen it go up again. Uh, there's no direct correlation with whether there is a lockdown or restrictions or not. And you know, similarly, on this third lockdown, you could say it's because of tier four restrictions. I don't know, you can argue that one way or another. Um, you saw a big spike starting mid-December and it started falling before the lockdown was put in place and has been falling fairly strongly uh, since. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a load in there I'd love to... I'll pick out a couple of that, and I don't, again, I don't want to get too ethical. You, 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 you mentioned two things. One uh, that struck me in particular, that question to do with jobs. It, is it, it's clearly the case that, um, uh, you know, if, if a workplace is fundamentally unsafe due to COVID. Oh, it wasn't. Okay, well, this is, but this is an interesting question, is that what in your, pers what in your perspective? Uh, sorry, I wasn't saying that that workplace was. I'm saying that if a workplace is fundamentally unsafe due to COVID, I think most reasonable people, and I wonder if this extends to yourself, would say it's fair enough that a, a worker should be able to say, I'm not comfortable to go in there. Wh where do we draw that line between a worker having a right to say, where would you draw that line between a worker having a right to say, I'm not comfortable to go in there, that I, I don't believe that to be COVID secure. I, I'm worried because I have a, a you know, a, um, um, a, a immunocompromised wife or, or girlfriend or husband or boyfriend or whatever it is. I won't go in and the problem that you've identified, which is uh, people saying that when actually it isn't the case. Where does that line fall? Because it's a I think, difficult I think, question. I think, I, think, I think most reasonable employers would seek to be accommodating for somebody who had personal circumstances which made them feel more uh, vulnerable. And I, I think that's right. But I, you know, I think by last summer, 
we'd had an enormous amount of effort going into the establishment of uh, working arrangements and principles for working arrangements, which sought to ensure that you could have COVID secure workplaces. And so, you know, I think the answer is, if the workplace is COVID secure, and it is possible to work within that environment safely, then it's a reasonable expectation that people should. Mm. Um, if there were additional personal circumstances, such as the ones you suggest, then I think an employer certainly ought to try to accommodate those. And do you think that should be legislated for? That, that, that people with unique circumstances have a right to decline to go into work uh, I don't, I, I don't, and can't be fired from their job for it, for example? Um, I, I, I would have to take legal advice. I don't know what oh, you yeah. need to legislate for it, and that I think if if there is a, a safety, a legitimate safety concern, uh, then I think probably there is already protection in place. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, I, I have a couple of questions that have been sent in on, on COVID that I want to get to, uh, and then we just got a couple of random ones to finish up because you've given us plenty of your time, and I uh, and I very much appreciate it. Um, and this is an, you're clearly ideologically opposed to uh, many of the restrictions that are currently in place, and, and we've established that. What um, uh, do you think somebody is within their rights to break the rules if they are ideologically opposed to them? At, at what point you said that you said. Uh, human rights or near absolute human rights. Um, if somebody considers something to be a, an infringement upon a human right or an absolute human right, at what point are they allowed to break a law and you would see them as being morally in the right? Well, I mean, I generally would say the difference is if you live in a democracy, you should obey the law. And, you know, I think it's particularly incumbent on people who are legislators. I can vote against things in Parliament. I can speak against them and I can get as angry as I like about them. Um, if I'm in the minority, you then uh, go along with the uh, the democratic uh, wishes that have been expressed. Uh, having said that, I guess to, to look at a kind of topical case, uh, seeing the sort of Amanda Holden um, outrage at the weekend, um, I, I think most people, if they got a, a sort of distressed call from an elderly parent uh, they hadn't seen for a year um, might well think well I'll go and, and make sure they're all right and you know the the boundaries in these guidelines uh, would be difficult in those circumstances if it was a health emergency then it might be all right um, if it's somebody who um, is um, having a, a sort of mental health crisis because they're feeling isolated um, or, or they're worried about um, the circumstances they're in, then maybe it's all right. Certainly, I would, you know, would not condemn somebody uh, for an act of compassion. But uh, see, that's, I suppose, the problem, though. And we're not going to get a, 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 a solid answer here at the end. I recognise that, that if those things are against the law, though, um, it's hard. It's hard to build compassion into uh, regulations, is it not? Uh, and, and would you defend somebody like Amanda Holden and say that she shouldn't be, uh, you, you know, that the law shouldn't apply in that case because of some sort of compassionate circumstances? I think it's quite a good idea for uh, prosecutors to um, uh, take a, a, a kind of uh, enlightened uh, view in balancing these things, and you know, it's. Uh, one thing to uh, prosecute people who have deliberately um, subverted uh, the law and organized a, a, a rave for a thousand people. Um, uh, the um, person who drives 200 miles to check that their elderly mother is all right, mm -hmm. um, it feels to me like that's in a different category. Okay, I want to ask a question from uh, Grant. I'd like to ask Sir Graham, is he at all concerned that the 2019 intake of Tory MPs are not holding the government to account as effectively as they should over the coronavirus restrictions? Somebody's not happy with the, the latest intake? Well, what I say, the House of Commons hasn't um, done what it should have done. And, you know, it struck me the, you know, the, the biggest point of concern for me um, was uh, in, uh, no, it was the 6th of January uh, when we had that vote on the 3rd lockdown. Uh, because it, it just seems to me that even if you were prepared to support the lockdown, um, it was wrong to vote through those powers for a three-month period. 
and, and that was the exchange that I had with the Prime Minister in the Chamber, was to ask him uh, to allow us votes at the end of January and the end of February mm -hmm. as well. And I just don't think Parliament, the House of Commons in particular, uh, should simply cede that degree of authority to a government um, for that period of time. Um, and that, you know, I, I think is a very, very serious concern. Do you think that this government has been deliberately, um, I don't know, subvertive in, in, in sneaking through some of this legislation that, that gives them all sorts of powers? I, I think it's, a, it's almost a law of nature that governments will seek to increase their powers and will seek to um, do things uh, with less scrutiny if they can. And it is possibly the most important role of Parliament uh, to be the countervailing force in that equation. Mm -hmm. It's not It's not a terribly bright indictment of government to, you know, that they will try to get away with whatever power they can. I, I think governments tend to do it. And it is why it's important to have the right checks mm -hmm. and balances and try to make sure that you've got a an independent parliament that is prepared to stand and, and, and stop that from happening. Mm -hmm. And that refers nicely to our conversation earlier about backbench government uh, MPs. A final question on COVID from Keir. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, could I ask Sir Graham whether he thinks that it is now likely that lockdowns will become a go-to measure whenever the NHS is under pressure from a future pandemic or a bad winter flu season? Um, I think I recognise that question. But yes, uh, it, will lockdowns become the new <laughs> the new normal? Well, they, they mustn't. And, you know, I think, um, as, as is well known, the World Health Organization says uh, lockdown should be a last resort. And they should be a last resort because they do so much harm. They do, obviously, enormous economic damage. But they do enormous damage to people's health. Uh, Two million people who have missed screening appointments uh, over the last year. And I'm told there's simply no capacity to catch that up. At least 30,000 fewer people having uh, treatment for cancer. Uh, than should be in a normal uh, period. People who miss treatment for strokes and heart disease, the massive uh, mental health crisis, uh, threefold increase in eating disorders reported amongst young people. Uh, these are things that have um, massive long-term impacts. And it, to the detail of the question, um, in order to prevent the NHS from being overwhelmed, um, well, obviously, at the beginning of this uh -huh. pandemic, the government put in place the Nightingale hospitals. Um, we should um, have had the capacity necessary. In fact, of course, in practice, the NHS has coped. Uh, I think it's been difficult in a lot of places. Uh, but actually, um, I, I think one of the not often enough told stories is how well the NHS um, managed to use that surge capacity to make sure that at the most difficult times it did manage to cope. But if we need to increase capacity at certain points of the NHS, and maybe it's the number of critical care beds, mm -hmm. uh, then we should do that. It would obviously be a more sensible thing to do than it's, con contemplating another lockdown. It's difficult, though. I was having a conversation only the other day. And this is a final question on COVID, I promise, with a, a student nurse working in the NHS who, I'll be honest, didn't have a lot of time for for, for Tory MPs because of what she perceived to be 10 years of or more of underfunding in the NHS, austerity in the NHS, which according to her had put the NHS in a position where it was further back than it needed to be. And you've just cited examples of, of deficiencies in care beds uh, uh, and, and ICU and all these kind of things. Was any of those decisions uh, made with the NHS under the last number of Conservative governments, ones which you regret? Well. Actually, I think the number of hospital beds being reduced and the number of critical care beds, I think that started under the Blair uh, government rather than Conservative government. Um, and you know, I, I think it's something we ought to look at uh, carefully in the context of the experience we've we've had. I, I suppose that you know, the, the difficult thing to say, but important to say, is that um, things have consequences. And that just as the regulatory mismanagement that led to or massively exacerbated the scale of the banking crisis um, had consequences for the public finances, which whilst the NHS was protected, um, did mean that its funding wasn't going to increase at the same rate as it might otherwise have done. Um, since then, we have had the biggest ever increase in NHS funding over the more recent period of three years. 
Um, but it's also important to say that the enormous cost of lockdowns, at the moment we're looking at what 280 billion of additional borrowing uh, this year, um, that is money that if it hadn't have been uh, spent uh, in paying for lockdowns, uh, could conceivably have been spent doing other things. But, but fact, would, it have, would it have been spent borrowing. doing other things? Well, because the, the, that level of borrowing is obviously the, something that a Conservative government is not inclined to do. Well, I don't think any government has been inclined to do it because it's not a very sensible thing to do. And the reason it's not a sensible thing to do it is that it needs financing in the long term and that, that reduces your ability to pay for the things you want to pay for on an ongoing basis, including the NHS. So, you know, it's not a an either or. You um, have lockdowns um, because you care about the NHS. Um, lockdowns have to be seen as the very last resort, mm -hmm. um, not least because if you carry on having lockdowns, you won't have the resources to do the things you want to do in public services. OK, uh, we'll, we'll leave COVID there uh, because, again, you've given up uh, lots of your time and we very much appreciate it. We've got three final questions, uh, two of which are slightly lighter. Uh, I suppose a slightly more serious one from uh, Jasmine May Thompson. She says, in 2013, uh, Sir Graham, you opposed same-sex marriage, citing religious freedom uh, in light of many advancements for the LGBT plus community since then. Do you stand by that position or have you become more sympathetic towards human rights for this community, she says. It's worth noting that, as I understand it, you voted for same-sex marriage provision in Northern Ireland in 2019, or at least in part, maybe a first reading or something. Um, a bottom line, do you regret voting against same-sex marriage in 2013? Uh, no, I don't. Um, but that's not because I disapproved of it. And I made that uh, point in my speech at the time, and I thought it was inevitable it was going to happen too. And I'd supported some years before that uh, civil partnerships, which gave all of the same, almost all of the same civil rights uh, as marriage uh, does. I was concerned about uh, religious freedom and remain concerned about it. Also very concerned that it was being done um, after a general election and it hadn't been in the manifesto. So whilst my own position uh, was and is a liberal one about it, um, I didn't think that I could answer constituents who had religious scruples about it, uh, honestly and fairly, uh, when uh, we didn't have the debate during the general election that preceded. So it's certainly a, a government and the party wishing to do it should have said that it was going to be put uh, before Parliament, uh, before the election. Have any of your concerns about religious freedom come to fruition after you, you lost that vote after same-sex marriage was passed. Not that I'm aware of. My concern uh, remains that the Church of England, uh, for that matter, if the Church of England continues um, not to wish to offer um, same-sex marriages, uh, but I, I think there's a very particular constitutional position for the Church of England and potentially one that could cause uh, difficulties in terms of the European Convention on Human Rights because the Church of England can be seen as an excrescent of the state and therefore could be um, potentially uh, required to do things in a way that other churches couldn't. Mm -hmm. um, uh, OK, well, we'll move on because I, 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 know I really do want to finish up. Uh, so a, fi a second to last question um, from uh, Jane. Uh, did David Cameron really have to resign in 2016? Um, well, uh, you said that was a light-hearted question. I suppose I'll, I'll try to give a light-hearted answer, which was that um, on the morning after the referendum, uh, starting at about 5.30 or quarter to six, I was doing a full media round because all of the uh, UK broadcast media uh, thought that um, the result of the referendum was going to cause some excitement within the Conservative Party, and they all wanted me on their radio or TV uh, programmes. Uh, so I'd just done about... Um, 20 different uh, broadcast interviews uh, starting very early. You get to the point where your lines are quite well practiced. And you know, I was then live on the BBC television on the green outside the Palace of Westminster and was asked again. And I again said how critically important it was that David Cameron uh, should remain prime minister so that we can have a period of calm and stability and markets can settle. And uh, as I was saying it, I could see on the little TV monitor in front of me uh, the no door of number 10 Downing Street opening. 
uh, you see David Cameron walking out to the uh, lectern outside and I could see the subtitle Cameron resigns uh, coming up on the screen, whereupon I had to change my position slightly to how important it was that we move seamlessly to the election of a new leader. Could he have clung on? Would you have wanted him to stay as Prime uh, Minister? I, I, th I thought it was certainly sensible to stay for a period of a few months. Um, w w I could understand that he might have found it difficult to stay beyond that, but I think it would have been perfectly possible for him to say, look, this is going to be a an uncertain uh, picture. Um, we thought we were going to, well, I thought I was going to win. Um, we haven't made the preparations that we would have made if we were anticipating the other result. Um, and I'm going to stay uh, for you know, a period mm -hmm. of months until we're in a, a more certain position. But, but no longer than that, essentially. Well, as I say, I, I, I think I, I can understand why he might not have wished yeah. him at that point, but I think it would have been better for him not to resign the day after the referendum. Yeah. Oh, OK. Interesting. Uh, and a final question to finish um, us up. Um, let me see. Uh, yeah. From Kate. Uh, what's your most bizarre Westminster moment? <laughs> oh, my word. Um, well, I mean, there have been lots of them, but I, I suppose um, a, a sort of purely bizarre one. Um, I would, in, in fact, oddly, it had some relevance to uh, Northern Ireland, I, th I think. Um, it was, uh, I was speaking on some motion relating to um, terrorism, and I think this was around about 1998 or 9, uh, and it was when we still habitually did late sittings in the Commons, and albeit it wasn't a hugely well-attended House of Commons, I was making a very serious speech about a very important and sensitive subject. And I, you know, I thought it was a bit disconcerting to find that members across the House started to giggle uh, during my speech. And um, it took me a few moments to realise uh, that they weren't laughing at me. They were laughing at a mouse which had just run across the floor of the House of Commons while I was uh, speaking. And it was a, certainly a sobering experience for me as a, an aspiring statesman at that point uh, that um, I got global press coverage uh, for the mouse. Um, and I, I, th I think they, they all like my Way response. to put you in your place. I, I said, ha, I, I smell a rat. And this was a headline in uh, newspapers from St. Petersburg to, uh, to Singapore. Um, I ju I, that, the Palace of Westminster is famously sort of collapsing. Um, and, and it require, I believe, I mean, what's your perspective on, because there's been chat, haven't there, about, I think, it, is the plan still that the House of Commons will temporarily move, move out. Uh, yes, I, I have the resources, but I'm not sure. But we're, we're, uh, well, we're, what's your perspective on that? Because there's a lot of money, too, a huge amount of money to spend to, to redo the Palace of Westminster and right. move out the Commons and stuff. What's your perspective on that? Um, well, they, they started doing a few years ago, they started taking a sort of horror story tours of the basement. And they go along and show you the asbestos and show you all these shafts filled with wires and how difficult it was to do anything with it. And um, essentially, to cut a long story short, the whole building was built with a kind of brilliant uh, Victorian air conditioning system with ducts that go um, in each direction, up vertically, horizontally, and across the, the building. And this uh, was all supposed to be powered by a fire in the middle um, that would um, lead to a, a current of air going up through a chimney and air being sucked in to keep the building cool. But this coincided with a great stink when the river was so full of um, unpleasant things that um, uh, in the summer uh, it became impossible to, to stay in Westminster. The whole palace was filled with foul air. Everybody had to leave and it was never used ever again. So these ducts have been used ever since for every new type of technology, whether it be electric cables or internet cables or heating pipes and so on. Um, and it's a, a terrible mess. But when I did the tour, I got to the end and I said to the chief engineer who taken me around, you know, am I being a bit thick here or, or couldn't you just replicate these ducts in the courtyards in the middle and then break it off into sections and do the building a bit at a time? And he said, oh, yes, yes, of course you could do that. He said, uh, um, we, we looked at that. He said it would it would cost a little bit more and take a little bit longer. Uh, well, I think my perspective, I, I take that. It might take a few years longer. It might cost a little bit more over a very long period of time. Uh, but I, I, th I think I would do it a bit at a time. Mm -hmm. We could get the House of Lords to move out while the Commons went into their chamber and then move back and so on. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I don't know. It's tricky, I suppose, because you can understand one hand why you'd want to, a magnificent old building like that. But then again, I suppose if you're in, I don't know, Glasgow, 
and you've got you know really in the high, you know deprivation in your local community it could be a slight affront to see billions of pounds being spent on Westminster yeah, it's I, a tricky I, I, you can I understand why people that get annoyed. that one's a little bit of a red herring because it's yeah. a grade one uh, world heritage site uh, I think we're going to end up spending the billions on keeping it in uh, good condition uh, for posterity uh, whether the um, House of Commons and the House of Lords are occupying it or mm -hmm. whether it's being used as a, a, a big museum or conference centre on the banks of the Thames. OK, uh, we'll leave it there. The Sir Graham Brady, thank you so much uh, for joining us, for giving up your time. We very much appreciate it. We got loads of questions in there. Thanks to everyone who submitted their questions. Uh, Lit Talks will be back, I believe, on Thursday. We have two announcements for our next two speakers. We will be doing that pub crawl at some stage and an invitation will be going to Sir Graham as it has to all of our guests. We will be having our pub crawl at some stage and we'll get the invitations out uh, very promptly. Thank you so much for giving up your time. Thank you to our audience for watching and have a lovely week. Thanks very much, guys. Thank you.